This week on the GCN Racing News Show, La Vuelta and the season near their conclusions, with Roglic looking good for a second consecutive win, despite being behind Carapaz on the GC. Uh, we'll look at some of Roglic's incredible stats from this season and indeed from his career. We've also got cyclocross and the infamous Koppenberg. Bad news from Australia as the early season races are cancelled. The 2021 Tour de France route and all the latest rider transfer news too. First up though, La Vuelta. Richard Carapaz started the second week in red, Primoz Roglic took it back for two days and then Carapaz ended the week back in it. Uh, it leaves things very close at the top of the GC table, four riders separated by just 35 seconds. Carapaz on top, Roglic just 10 seconds back in second, Carthy third at 32 seconds and Dan Martin at 35. It should set up a tantalizing final week, or will it? Because the race resumes tomorrow with a 34k individual time trial, and if Roglic is anywhere close to his best form, you'd expect him to put at least a minute into all of his rivals. And with just one more major mountain stage to go, it feels to me like the race is his to lose. Now his rivals will be hoping that he has a jour sans, as the French would say, but with the way that he's been riding, that seems very unlikely. He's just an incredible rider, Primoz Roglic, isn't he? When he has a bad day, he loses seconds and not minutes. And it's his consistency which I find so staggering. So in this 2020 season, he competed for the first time this year at the Slovenian National Championships at the end of June. So far since then, he's had 44 days of competition and his strike rate is as follows. 10 wins, 27 top 10s and 24 top 5s. And his consistency is even more impressive when you look at his last 12 stage races. His finishing positions, second, DNF, first, first, third, first, first, third, fourth, first, first, first. He's also the first rider since Giuseppe Saroni to have won a stage in his first seven Grand Tours. And of pro riders who've competed in the 21st century, he now sits fourth in terms of days spent leading Grand Tours. Uh, that's behind Chris Froome, Alberto Contador and Vincenzo Nibali. Now I might be counting chickens here before they've hatched, but I can't see Roglic losing this one now. And you have to say, he thoroughly deserves to win, particularly given the incredible disappointment of that penultimate day of the Tour de France. Uh, that said, we definitely should not count out Richard Carapaz, who's looking brilliant in that red jersey, uh, Hugh Carthy, or indeed Dan Martin. Nor, in fact, should we write off Mobistar. Now their tactics haven't quite paid off so far in the way that they'd have liked, but there is no doubt they'll throw everything, including the kitchen sink, at it to try and win this thing in the final week. Just the same in some respects, they haven't got more mountains upon which to do it. Although, as we have seen in the world in recent years, the race can be turned on its head when you least expect it. Anyway, you can let us know who you think is going to win this year's Wells at this point by taking the poll that's over on the GCN app, a link to which you can find on your screen right now. Now, one rider who is competing currently at the Welter is the Dane Michael Vulgren of NTT Pro Cycling, and he shared his stats from the last 12 months on Instagram yesterday. So, 1,144 hours on the bike, an average of 22 hours per week, 36,295 kilometers, or an average of 100 kilometers every single day, and almost 500 kilometers of vertical ascent. Uh, that was a screen grab from his Training Peaks account, and for the training geeks amongst you, he's racked up 56,000 TSS points, and he currently has a CTL of 192. Ouch. Uh, the other talking point from last week at La Vuelta was the rider strike from the morning of stage 11. Chris Froome was leading it and it was in relation to the time gaps that had been given at the previous day's finish. Now the Vuelta organisation had classified that stage as one that would finish in a mass sprint and as such the rules dictate there has to be at least a three second gap between two consecutive rides crossing the finish line for any gap to be given at all. However, after the stage, the UCI intervened and said it shouldn't have been deemed as a mass sprint stage and therefore changed it, meaning that there only needed to be a one second gap for gaps to be counted. And that meant that Carapaz lost three seconds and the race leader's jersey and other rides were caught out too, including Hugh Carthy. And now Rory Sutherland of the Israel Startup Nation put out a statement on behalf of all of the rides at the race yesterday, so check out his social media if you'd like to see that. But I'm backing the riders on this one. You can't change the rules after the race, that's just ridiculous. 
And now, even if the roadbook says that it's going to be deemed as a mass sprint, you'd imagine that GC riders will constantly worry as to whether or not that's going to get changed after the matter. Uh, anyway, this is what EF Pro Cycling's Jonathan Vaught has had to say on the subject on yesterday's breakaway post-race show. I've seen um, in this world, it seems like the riders have been uh, pretty unified in their approach a couple of times. Um, and that's good to see. Um, you know, I hope we get to the point where we aren't going to have to be doing protests anymore that actually uh, the commissars, the UCI and the race organizers start listening to the riders in advance of the race so that we don't have to have these, you know, protests and altercations and, you know, writing letters and all this other stuff that, that seems to upset them. Um, you know, it, it'll be good if we get to the point where uh, the riders union is able to to really have a voice in you know in the design of these courses and in the way the rules are executed um, you know because they were right I mean, the riders were right on that day that was a, you know I, the, the, the the commissars just decided to you know to sort of redo the rules at the last at their whim and that is all too consistent of a theme with the UCI is that they just like to do things their way when they want to. Um, and I think it's good that the writers call them out on it. Don't forget that you can get daily live coverage and analysis, territory restrictions do apply, over on our race pass for the next week and the final week of La Vuelta. Anyway, we are going to move on now to the 2021 Tour de France because last night we had the route presentation. Uh, the race, as we already knew, will not start in Copenhagen, Denmark, as originally planned, but rather in Brittany. Reason being that they've had to move the dates forward by a week because of the Olympics being postponed to next year, and that date change meant that the Grand Depart clashes with a European Championships football match also in Denmark. It's all very complicated, but anyway, Brittany it is for the Grand Depart. Uh, the first stage starts in Brest and race director Christian Prudhomme talked about the open nature of that route and the fact that wind could split things already on day one. Either way, it doesn't sound like it's going to end up in a bump sprint, uh, finishing as they do up the Côte de la Force au Loup. Uh, that's on June the 26th and then the following day is another one for the GC riders to remain vigilant, finishing as it does with two ascents of the famous Mur de Bretagne. Uh, Dan Martin, who's riding so well of course at the Welch at the moment, was the last man to win there at the Tour de France. That was two years ago in 2018. And it's always a climb in fact that sees the GC riders battle it out. It comes on day two already. Uh, that's also the day where we'll see the eighth edition of La Course taking place over the same course. Stage three is the first, in fact, for the sprinters at next year's race, finishing for the first time in Pontivy, birthplace of UCI president David Lapartion. Stage four is another one for the sprinters, and then stage five is an individual time trial of 27 kilometers. Pogaccia should romp that one, shouldn't he? Uh, Prudhomme again mentioned the chance of echelons on stage six to Chateauroux, while stage seven is the longest of the race at 248 kilometers. And in fact, that's the longest stage of any Tour de France in the past two decades. Going old school there. Uh, it's not flat actually either. Uh, the second half of that stage is peppered with tough little climbs. There's 3,300 meters of total elevation gain. So that's definitely going to be a hard day out for all. The second weekend marks the first of the mountains, including the Col de la Colombière before a descent to the finish at Le Grand Bournon. Uh, that is on Saturday stage eight, and that's where Alaphilippe took his first stage victory at the Tour de France. Stage nine is the first mountaintop finish of next year's race at Tignes, over 2,100 meters above sea level. And that was the climb where last year's stage, which was dramatically shortened due to a hailstorm, was due to finish. After the first rest day, it's another opportunity for the sprinters. And then on stage 11, we visit Mont Ventoux. Not just once, but twice from two different sides. That is going to be fantastic. Although it doesn't finish at the summit this time, uh, they descend to the finish line in Molossen. Nimes hosts the finish the following day, so that should be another one for the sprinters. And then we're back into the mountains. Carcassonne to Kia, although that doesn't look too tough on paper. And it's a similar story the following day. Uh, despite heading into Andorra, they do have mountains there, but they come a little way from the finish line. Stage 17, though, is a big one. 
178 kilometers with a raft of climbing in the last third of the day. The Perisud, where Pogacar of course was so impressive this year, then the Val Laurent Azé, and then finishing up the Col de Porte, 2,215 meters above sea level. Stage 18 has yet more famous mountains with the Col de Tourmalet and another mountaintop finish to Luzard de Den. In fact, it's the first time we've seen a Tour de France stage finish there in 10 years. Stage 19 is for the sprinters again, and so it's stage 20 that's the final day for a GC shakeup. And it's another time trial. 31 kilometers in length, so we've got a total of almost 60 k's of time trialing next year. And then stage 21, as we all could have predicted, will be the usual sprinters world championships around the Champs-Élysées in Paris. I have to say, having seen the route announced, I'm already very excited and we've still got seven months to go. Moving on to cyclocross now, and the first race of the XO2 Bardkama series, formerly the DVB Trophy, was held on its traditional date of November the 1st on the notorious Koppenberg course. In the women's event, it was Denise Betsema of Power Sows on Bingo who kicked off. Three riders joined her after the first lap, they being Yara Kasteline, Amory Vorst and Lucinda Brandt. Now, even though Betsema would attack first and set a blistering pace that looked like it wouldn't be matched, uh, Betsema would ultimately fade and it became a race of three. Castellan would attack on the next lap, then Brandt, and in the final, Anne-Marie Vost. And it was she who would go on to take the win, her first of the season, a full one minute ahead of Betsema. In the men's race, it was kicked off by an aggressive Ellie Isabet. Uh, Tone Arts made the group, as did Quentin Hermans, Lars van der Haar, and Michael van Turenhout. Isabet and Arts traded attacks back and forth for the first 20 minutes, but after that, Isabet had enough and shot off like a rocket ship leaving the ground for the moon and strung together 10 minutes of intense pace, the perfect line choice, and gap everybody else. Uh, he then continued to ride flawless laps with almost no mistakes at all, to take a massive bite out of the competition. Uh, Lars van der Haar, the Dutchman, would end up finishing in second place, but a full 40 seconds behind Ezebit, and Tone Arts would finish at 1 minute 20 seconds down on the winner of the day. Ezebit, by everybody's admission, was on incredible form on Saturday. Right, rider transfer news now, and first up, Mitchelton Scott announced a new rider on the women's team last week. To Neil Campbell, the 23-year-old from Trinidad and Tobago, will be with the Australian squad for at least the next two years. Meanwhile, world champion Megan Yastrab will move from rally cycling to Team Sunweb. Uh, she turns just 19 in January, but I wouldn't be at all surprised to see her taking a couple of big wins already next year. Ryan Gibbons, the South African national champion who has ridden for Team NTT in its various incarnations for his entire five-year career, will move on to Parsha's new next year regardless of whether NTT find a new sponsor. And that new team for him will be UAE Team Emirates. And now NTT are still in search of a sponsor to keep them afloat next year and beyond, and I for one have my fingers crossed that they'll find one. Meanwhile, Lachlan Morton has renewed with EF Pro Cycling, and they announced last week that any rider who took a pay cut this year due to COVID-19 and lockdown will be offered a contract for next year, which is fantastic news and a very nice gesture. Although I'm presuming they just mean for the rides within their own team and not for rides in other teams. Otherwise, that could be very good news for a lot of riders elsewhere. I was also incredibly pleased, actually, to see that Simon Geschke will be continuing his career into next year. He moves from Team CCC over to Cofidis in 2021 for what will be his 14th season as a pro rider. Now the bad news, as mentioned in the introduction, is that the start of next season will look very different because most of the Australian races have now been officially cancelled. They include both the Cattle Evans Great Ocean Road Race and indeed the Tour Down Under. Uh, very disappointing news, but I guess not unexpected given what's happening in the world right now. Uh, we should see them though return back in 2022, fingers crossed. All right, that is all for this week's GCN Racing News Show. I'll be back with the breakaway tomorrow evening, so I hope to see you then. Goodbye for now.